Let's do an experiment that shows how salt in solution behaves and how that might affect the ocean. Let's get started. Let me show you how big this salt bag is. 40 pounds, baby. There's a lot of experiments we can do with that salt. Here's my thrift store glassware. Just don't heat it or it'll crack. You can see the salt I'm adding is pretty large crystals, almost like how they sell Himalayan salt. This makes the dissolving process go a little slower than if it were small crystals or powdered crystals. Let me clean up these little runaways. We'll need a second glass for mixing. Here's some water. It's purified, but I don't think that will really matter for this experiment. You could try to still purified tap. Because there's so much salt solute dissolving, the trace amounts of calcium and other minerals in the water won't matter much. Unless they do, in which case I should have used distilled water. Let's collect a bit of data. You can see my film room's a bit chilly. Let's see how cool the water is. I let it sit at room temp the last few hours, so it should be almost isothermic. 13.6 or 13.7, that's about 57 Fahrenheit. It's holding relatively constant, even though heat exchange with the room will lead to a few more degree drop over the next few hours. Here's where the magic starts. What do you notice about the solution? I add the thermometer, and what do you think the temperature does? It drops, 11.7 or 11.8 Celsius, or 53 Fahrenheit. That's a two degree Celsius drop just by adding salt. I'll talk about a few reasons for that in just a sec, but start thinking about it. Now watch what happens when I stir. The temp drops a little. The act of stirring increases the rate of dissolving, which in turn leads to a bit more of a temperature drop. Not huge, but a bit. Let's put our thermometer away and fix our eyeballs on the cup. Now, if you're Sherlock Holmes, you might notice something right away. For the rest of us, let me shift our vantage point. Do you see it now? Right there. A distinct layer is formed. To show you a little more clearly, I'm going to need to take out some water with the syringe so it doesn't overflow. See where that drop hit? Let me show you the layer a little better. If I swish the solution with my finger, you can see this very distinct layer that's formed at the bottom. What do you think caused that? I can tell you the whole thing's extremely salty, so we're not talking about fresh water and salt water. Let's get closer. This layer looks like oil, except oil is much less dense than water, so it floats on the surface. This layer's on the bottom, which suggests it's more dense. Density relates to molarity, which is another way of talking about concentration. The bottom layer usually extends above the salt about half a fingernail. Depending on when you stir with your finger, which in most experiments is not a great stirring implement, you might feel the temp drop. Eventually, the temp stops dropping. Any ideas why? It has to do with how saturated the solution gets. Let's make a little trench down in the salt so we can see this layer a bit more clearly. To see this a little better, let's grab some food coloring. I'll use red. If you try this, make sure you get the kind I have here and not the gels. The gels are troublesome. Check this out. I don't really know how to describe it, like an amoeboid column. I find it very mesmerizing. I'll put a couple more in. Let me speed up the diffusion a little and give a quick spin. Look at how clearly the layers separated. Now I'm pretty sure I'll regret this, but I'm going to put in some blue to see the cool diffusion column again. That should make a nice purple. Look at the stability of this layer. I'm going to mix it a little and see how it responds. It mixed a bit, and I'm a little distracted by the fact the color seems to be green. I have no idea why blue and red made pond green color. If you can explain why three drops red and one drop blue make pond green, you get a gold star for the day. Let me speed up the next couple minutes and check out what happens. The layers start to separate again. Why does this bottom layer want to keep going back to clear? Why is the bottom of the glass still clear? Why did the temperature change? Let's see if we can figure some things out now. Our solution's sort of back to a blue. Let me put a light under it and see if you can see. Does that come through? I don't know. Still looks kind of weird if you ask me. I expected purple. We got like blue and red chunks sitting on the salt. Let's get a little better visual here. Almost immediately we get our nice little layer. <laughs> so cool. That's the experiment in 10 seconds. <laughs> Sorry for the last four minutes. So what's going on? Let's talk about the temperature change. The solid salt looks a little like this. It's sodiums that are ionically bonded to chlorides. 
chloride gets a little bigger because it gets an extra electron. Sodium gets a little smaller because it loses an electron. And then they stick together by the positive pretty much sticking to the negative. This is a really strong bond between sodium and chloride. So in order to pull a sodium out of the crystal lattice that's formed, that's going to take some energy. Or to pull off a chloride, that's going to take some energy. These have little magnets. So it takes me some energy. I got to like really work pretty hard to pull these off. Well, maybe not super hard, but I got I to gotta try. So what's that mean? Where is the energy coming from to actually pull apart our salt crystals? The energy to pull apart the salt crystals is coming from the water. As we pull apart the salt crystal, the energy to do that came from the water, which is going to cool the water. Okay, so that's number one. Then you have the water, which is interacting via hydrogen bonds. Let me draw one. The electronegativity of the oxygen makes it partially negative while it pulls away electrons from the hydrogen's proton. So the hydrogen side of the water becomes partially positive. That's creating our hydrogen bond between waters, which I'll just call an H bond. So in order to make space for the sodium chloride that's going into solution, it's going to get surrounded by these waters, but the water has to pull apart first. In the Pulling a part of water is sort of breaking hydrogen bonds. That's also an energy input that has to come from the water. So we have two things right now that put energy into breaking apart the salt, which both cooled the water. Now there's one final step that's going to result in energy being released. Check this out. So let's say we're talking about our sodium. It's going to get surrounded by a bunch of waters and not really a bunch. From what I've read, like six to eight waters are going to surround that to sort of neutralize the positive charge that's there. They're going to dump electron density, the oxygen side, to sort of decrease that positiveness because nature doesn't like just a random positive floating around. In order for sodium and chloride to be happy split apart, they have to be at a really high temperature. So the sodium in solution would look something like this. And we see those oxygens pumping in electron density into that sodium. I only drew about four, but in reality, there's probably going to be like six to eight because we're going to be in three dimensions. And what about the chloride? The chloride in solution would just have the water flipped. So instead of the oxygen, the hydrogen side that's positive or partially positive would be pulling some electron density away from our chloride ion. When these hydration shells get made, that results in energy being released, which works to warm the water. So some salts are going to warm up. Some salts are going to cool down. Sodium chloride happens to cool down. Why does it cool down? We could show it like this. Energy went into splitting it. Stay. It's the first thing that happened. Then energy went into sort of separating the waters to make space for the sodium or the chloride. And then once that happened, it got surrounded by the water, which released energy. But the amount of energy released wasn't greater than the amount of energy that went in. So the sodium and chloride at the end that are surrounded by water in these cool little hydration shells ended up being endothermic. More energy went in than went out. So that's what's going on with the temperature, I think. Now, if I missed a little something or you know a little bit more, let me know. One of the main reasons that I love doing these little experiments is some of you know a lot about these things and I just kind of enjoy reading about them and learning by doing. Let me know in the comments if you know something that we can add and maybe in the future I can toss that in there. Now let's look at this bottom layer. Check that out. I think this might be the most interesting part of the experiment. The reason I'm curious about it is one of the big issues in the world. You know, we got energy and fresh water is a really big one. And one of the ways that we generate fresh water now is by taking salt water from the ocean and then purifying it in a variety of different ways. And then the byproduct of that is oftentimes really salty water. And then deciding what to do with that really salty water is pretty important because what I wonder is, if we messed with the concentration of areas of the ocean too much, what, what would that do to those areas? What would be the long-term effects? And like, how stable is this layer? This has been here for a day and it seems to have gotten even more stable. 
granted we have this huge chunk of salt in the bottom but all of that to say i'm just curious i don't I don't really want to ruin the ocean and I also want people to have fresh water so hopefully this can be like an introductory for me and maybe you to be thinking about that. So why is this layer so salty? Here's a couple things. We're at a set temperature. I'm not really cooling it or heating it so that's important. We can do that in the future. So why does it get so salty right there? Here's my general thought. You have the sodium and the chloride surrounded by water And these six to eight waters surrounding the sodium chloride are what's required for the sodium to be excited or willing to break apart in solution. What happens when there's not six to eight waters to surround a sodium ion or a chloride ion? I don't think it can really dissolve anymore. And that's sort of what we have happening here, where if there's another sodium and chloride, they have to go to where there's available waters. And why don't the waters diffuse down into the sodium and the chloride? Well, it's really about density. A water has a mass of about 18. The chlorines have a mass of about 35.5. And sodium is about 23. So if you think about a given space, the space that has these extra large elements in it, like chlorine, and sodium that are bigger than that 18, they're gonna travel as a group with that hydration shell of water that's surrounding them, and that's gonna make that area a little bit more dense. There's a little bit more mass in the given volume, and whenever there's more mass in a given volume, it's gonna sink. And if you have enough salt in a given area, like at the bottom here, all the available waters are gonna get used up in surrounding sodiums and chlorides so that there's probably not really too many just free H2Os floating around that aren't surrounding a sodium and a chloride. And that makes that layer really, really dense. And layers above, like right in here, they're still really salty, but the difference is there's still some free floating H2Os around. And the fact that there's free floating H2Os around as well as the salt hydration shells. I'll just draw them like circles. As well as those hydration shells, mean that there's less mass in that given area or volume, so it's less dense. So these really, really dense layers just sink to the bottom, and it seems like the water isn't really able to permeate down into there very well at all. And that might just be because there's so much salt. But what I have found is when there's not a lot of salt, this, the layers still sit for a while. So we'll do an experiment on that in the future. And this all relates to why the temperature stops cooling. We had that two degree temperature drop, but why does it stop going down? Eventually, you have no more water that can break off salts from the chunk, because we need water to surround our little sodiums. And when there's no more available water to surround the sodium, the sodium doesn't break off, which means energy doesn't go into breaking it off and spreading out, and we have no more endothermic pulling of energy from our surrounding water, it stops cooling. All that's pretty neat, fun little introduction to solutions for me, maybe kind of fun for you. If you have more thoughts, I'm sure we could <laughs> figure out some more things, but that's enough for today. That's a bit longer than I had anticipated, but very fun hanging out. Stay curious. Let's do this again soon.